Thank you for joining us this week on The Tongue with Dr. Mike. I'm so glad you're back with us again. As always, make sure you're checking out our website, thetonguespeakslife.com, where you can listen to all those podcasts from the past couple weeks. Of course, if you want our full catalog of topics from before, not just from The Tongue with Dr. Mike, but from Pillars of Heaven, make sure you're going to Psalm346ministries.org or simply type in p346.org. Also, if you're on Facebook, make sure you're going to Psalm 346 Ministries. Join that group. That is great discussion going on in there. That that group is growing every day. Join Brianna for prayers on Thursday. You can give your prayer requests right there. You can uh, focus. Uh, you can listen to all of our stuff. Everything that's going on is right there on Psalm 346 Ministries. From the Tongue with Dr. Mike to Pillars of Heaven to man if you haven't listened to pillars of heaven get it get it get on there and listen to pillars of heaven that's uh, a fun show with jb and, and Bree jones and we have special guests on there the board of directors are on there every once in a while we have cool topics stuff that's going on around the world make sure you're going there the, the tongue speaks life.com or psalm 346 ministries.org either one on the tongue page you can look at cure international man what a difference they're making in children's and families' lives across the world, man. Uh, I can't say it enough. God bless the little children. You know, I, I did an interview with them that I'm still trying to get copies of so that I can uh, send that out there. But check it out. Their, their mission is, is straight from Luke 9, 2, and where it says Jesus sent them out to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God. And they are doing that every day. Um they, they do that through their network of pediat uh, pediatric surgical hospitals that serve just children. Man, God bless the little children. There's a link right there on the website. You can donate directly to them. You can donate directly to the tonguespeakslife.com. You can donate to Psalm 346 Ministries. That all goes to the same place. The Tongue with Dr. Mike, Pillars of Heaven, to each of our, out our outreach programs like Oh, man, you name it. Bibles for everybody, our food drives. You know, a special thank you to everybody who donated before. I uh, want to say a quick hello to Pastor Simon and Bushfire Church in South Sudan. Man, what a, what a great man of God he is. God bless you, brother. Thank you for your prayers and everything. And, and uh, man, I hope we see you soon. I, I really do. Uh, as our family keeps growing, I want to say welcome back. God bless you wherever you're hearing this from. And man, we are we're growing, man. We're over eight million people that that's that uh, have some for to, form of God's word in front of their face every day. And uh, so here we go. Let's keep going on. The today's topic is entitled "Changes" or "Changes in Your Life" or "Changing Your Life," whatever it has to do with change, man. And change is not easy. And uh, <laughs> I am living proof of that. So, are you ready to embark on a journey of change in this life? In this life, we don't stop growing, but we, you know, we inevitably we want to be growing in a beneficial direction, right? We want to be transforming ourselves and bettering ourselves, you know, bettering our life every single day. That's an ongoing process. And the ultimate goal there is, is to have great relationships, uh, contentment, peace, happiness. In the end, you know, you want the path that leads to change for you is making the decision you want. And, and that starts with the decision to want to change and then remaining on the path that you set before you. Right. So if you're feeling stuck and un unsure of which way to turn, uh, you know, for me, there's no worse feeling than being undecided and unsure. The, there's so many times where I wish I had somebody there who just knew it all to just tell me what to do, you know, which way to go, how I should feel about it. It's, it's super si simple, you know, and much easier. There's two types of people. And, you know, my brother and I are, are one of each of these types of people. And, uh, it, it's a theory, but there are two types. There's there's those who read the instructions and they follow the plan, and and there's the others who don't read the instructions and do it their own way, right? Those who plan and those who don't. No condemnation for either party, right? But it's important to know which one of those you are. You know how you do things and how you are programmed and wired to respond to life. There are times when planning is crucial and following the roadmap and the instructions is, is vitally important. 
you know, how many times have you thought to yourself, man, if I had just listened or followed that recipe or, or that instruction manual, you know, <laughs> having said that, the other's true as well, right? Not being completely obsessed with the plan uh, and the instruction, that has its place also. Life happens to us, you know, regardless. And, you know, our plans get put on hold and sometimes an emergency plan B is needed. Life has a way of doing its own thing. You know, we need to learn to be flexible. Unfortunately, life didn't come with a manual and there isn't always a clear and perfect way to do something other than this book here, the Bible, right? But when you reach that crossroad, uh, maybe you're at that crossroad right now. Have you reached that crossroad in your life? Is it time for a change? Is it time to reinvent yourself? You know, what is the question you're asking yourself and what will the outcome be? More importantly, do you ask yourself questions? You know, do you self-reflect or are you on the road of who knows, aimlessly just going wherever life takes you? Now, I know lots of people like that and then some, some it works out well for them and others <laughs> definitely not. But have you noticed that, you know, you make life decisions so easily and with so little thought and yet the outcome has been massive? Maybe you can acknowledge that you're, you're stuck and that you need change, but you're not sure how to get it. There's a couple steps you need to do to take change or to make change. And self-reflecting is definitely a huge part of this. Take the time to look at your past. Look at the decisions you've made. Look at the decisions other people have made and, and how that's impacted you. Reflect on the past. Remember you know, that it's in the past, though. You might want to go down the road of guilt and condemnation, but really there's no point to that. It's done, and the best way to move forward is by apologizing to yourself and probably others and learning how to do it differently, differently in the future if you run across that same scenario, right? It's vitally important that as you self-reflect, you don't compare yourself to other people in that process because you, know, you, you measure what you've done against you. Acknowledge how far you've come and focus on all the positive that you have achieved, right? The act of reflecting is, is, is casting back a, a light or, or mirroring or giving back or showing an image. Um, and these are just stupid definitions, right? Fixing the thoughts on something, careful consideration, uh, thoughtful consideration or meditation. You know, you have to be honest and you have to reflect to know. Know what happened. Know what happened in the past and how to make good decisions for the future. You should also be reflecting on what has worked so that you can, you know, continue along that right path when, when that's necessary as well. Seek advice or help. You know, there's, there's self-help and there's seeking help. And both of these are important, and a lot of people struggle with these. Self-help is incredibly beneficial. And maybe through, uh, who knows, spending time on yourself uh, in thought, in prayer, in meditation, reading books, doing courses, doing research in the area you need to grow in. And that needs your attention, right? Getting help from, from a professional is, is equally beneficial. And ideally, the two should go hand in hand. Right, a coach or a therapist, they have the knowledge and the experience behind them. They've witnessed many other stories to help guide you in your journey. Right, you know that knowledge has power. And I remember being in college, and there was a poster on the board, and it says, "Knowledge is power." And I used to read that every single day, every single day, and, and it stuck with me my whole life. Knowledge is power. You know, professionals can often see the picture more clearly without being, uh, the, the good news is they're, they, they're not biased and, and they don't have complication. They're standing on the outside looking in, right? The most beneficial uh, aspect of therapy uh, is accountability you have with the professional. Having somebody keeping you accountable has more meaning and power within your brain than you might think. So in today's world, uh, think about online healthcare, right? That covers all your needs. It, you can access it uh, easily. Uh, it removes the, the stigma and the shame associated with many of the other therapies, right? And it's often more th uh, affordable and, and convenient for you, right? So online healthcare, very beneficial. Making the decision to change and how to change, right? What is the goal? Only you have the power and only you have the means, 
right? You've all heard that old saying, you can take the, the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. There is so much truth in that saying. You're the only one who can change your life. You're the only one who can make it happen. You can hear story after story of people that have been forced into change and given ever, every opportunity, right? But then they fall back into the old habits because it, it, was, it was not through their own willpower and, and their own strength, right? You're the only one who can enforce that change. So what does your story look like? What chapter are you on? Are you struggling to turn that page? Not sure how to write the next page? You know, for each of us, the choices and the stories are all different. The conclusion is that you can decide on your ending, though. Picture it, right? You, you imagine it, you picture it, you act on it. Think of yourself as a work in progress and always remember that the end goal is that happy, fulfilled life, right? You have the power, change is possible, help is available, set the course in motion, Every time a new politician steps into the ring, right, he promises that same thing, change. But change can be good or bad, right? We know we should change all sorts of things. Change your oil, change your light bulbs, change dirty diapers, right? Growth requires change. But many people believe that um, we should also change our morals or our ethics and our beliefs to accommodate these changes in culture. But should everything be open to change? You know, the Bible gives us a clear guideline on what should change and what should stay the same. In Malachi, it says, I, the Lord, never change. God declares that. So that's where we start, right? Change means a move in another direction. For God to change would mean that he either becomes better or worse. And God is ultimate perfection, right? He can't change because he cannot be better than he already is, and he cannot fail and become less perfect. So he can't become worse than he is. God's quality of never changing is perfect. God never changes, and nothing about him changes. His character traits such as, you know, love and mercy and kindness and justice and wisdom, they always exist in perfection, the methods he uses to deal with human beings have changed, you know, throughout the centuries, but the values and the purposes behind those methods did not. For example, right under, under Moses, the covenant there, God declared that anim animals were sacrificed in, in, in a specific manner that he prescribed, and that would atone for the sins of the people, right? You can read that, man, all over the Old Testament, Leviticus, Numbers, you know, wherever, under the terms of the new covenant, the Son of God himself became the sacrifice, and the old system, having served its purpose, became obsolete, right? God's holiness, uh, his, his wrath against sin, and his extension of mercy did not change, but he did provide a better sacrifice for us, the perfect Lamb of God. That change from the old covenant to the new was needed, right? And it's wonderful, and, and it secures eternal life for those who trust in Christ. God never changes, but people do. Our bodies, our brains, our ideas, our values, they all change. In fact, you know, God built us in, he built that into us, that ability to change. Part of being created in God's image is that human beings can think, they can reason, and they come to conclusions distinct from physical or material realities. When God created Adam and Eve, they were perfect, right? Any change they experienced was good as they tended the garden and they, they learned more of God and of each other. But sin brought about a negative change that altered not only Adam and Eve's behavior and their thinking, but also their very nature. As a result, their environment changed, along with all of human history. <coughs> Excuse me. In our sin, we lost our perfect environment and were left to rest survival from an unforgiving planet, right? Change had come, and it was not a good one. Even when mankind fell into sin, God still didn't change. His love for humanity and his desire for fellowship with them remained the same. So what did he do? He takes steps to redeem us from our sins. We're powerless to change ourselves in that regard, right? He sent his only begotten son to save us. Repentance and faith in Christ is God's avenue of change to restore us to himself. Once we're in Christ, 
Everything changes, right? We're born again. Our ideas change. Our perspective changes. Our values and actions change. They line up with God's word. And as the Holy Spirit works within us, we find that the old is gone and the new is here, right? Just like 2 Corinthians says. The Christian life is an ongoing series of changes as we grow in knowledge, as we grow in faith and holiness, right? We grow in Christ and growth requires change. Every good change can be uncomfortable and, and, and scary, right? Think about the Israelis, right? The Israelites in, in, in slavery in Egypt. And at first they resist Moses' attempt to free them, believing that Moses was just a troublemaker who was making things worse for them. And, and he did, right? Things did get worse before they got better. Think about at the pool where Jesus found the, the, the man who suffered his condition for a long time. And, you know, and Jesus asked him there, do you want to get well? Right? That's a strange question, but, but it has a logical purpose. Before the Lord introduced that man to lifelong change, he wanted to know, do you really want this? Or are you comfortable with your life of begging and living off the charity of others? Are you ready to change? Some people believe that God's word must change or, 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 or adapt to keep up with the times. Right, but, but Jesus strongly validates the scriptures and called them truth. He said, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the, the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. If God's character doesn't change, then his word doesn't change. His truth, his standards, his way of salvation never change, right? Changeable humans do not have the power or authority to change God's words. And only the foolish people are going to try that. Change for its own sake is neither good or bad. It depends on the, on the direction, really, that, that the change takes you. You should be willing to change your minds and your lifestyles when you're shown from God's word uh, that we're wrong. right? You should embrace change, no matter how hard it is, when it comes from God. <laughs> Excuse me. But we must respect that, that some things never change and they're not meant to. Pretending we can change God or his word to fit our, our preference is such a dangerous idea. It leads only to destruction. God does not change, right? How can we rely on his, on his promises if he did? How could we embrace hope or pursue a fearless devotion to our savior. We rely on him to be the unchanging center of our chaotic world. Christians, you know, should expect to be altered and adjusted constantly. When Christ enters our life, he changes us, not just once, but day by day, right? We're children of a living God who's alive and active in us by his spirit. You know, Eric Raymond wrote one time that as Christians, we must remember that change is really at the heart of what it means to be a Christian, right? Believers, they have to put on that new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, right? Certain aspects of the believer's world should withstand the pressure to change, but we hold others in an open hand, right? What does the Bible say about change? You often hear it said that there's nothing new under the sun, right? Ecclesiastes 1.9. In some ways, the world is, is much the same as it's always been. Violence, greed, laziness, pride, idolatry. They're all common features of our world since the first sin, right? Essentially, every generation of people in the same, they're, they're doing the same as the last in terms of the nature of our sins, even Jesus cried, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? He's referring to how slow his disciples were to understand who he was and the nature of the healing that he offered, right? But Christ's words remind us that their understandings and attitudes were not new. How long would Jesus have to put up with them, with their faithlessness and their ignorance? How many literations of the faith, uh, of the faithlessness, had they already endured? What these men represented individually was the story of Israel throughout the generations. 
the Lord repeated a cycle of inviting, loving, and instructing his children to behave righteously before they sinned and had to face his discipline. Over and over, he adjusted their circumstance so that their hearts would undergo transformation. Fortunately, the Christian's answer to suffering has not changed. Right? Joshua 1.9 is often invoked when one fights an obvious enemy such as disease or abuse. But there's an important implication within that declaration to be strong and courageous, to not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I read that at the end of every one of these broadcasts. Right? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We can expect significant changes to our peace and, and our, our, our transformation throughout our lives. We remain still in him, but as we do, our faith in the Lord changes, not in its direction or its nature, but in its depth and the outworking of the faith in, in, in front of a watched world, right? Wherever we go is both a temporal and a spiritual concept. We will travel and wander in the physical sense as we move between homes, from parents to independents to our own families, from one job to the next, right? Even the nomads will remain unchanged, right? If he does not come face to face with the living God and allow the Lord to do a refining work inside of him, that's the spiritual faucet of movement. As we pursue Christ more and more, looking for him in whatever's going on around us, he also goes with us. Refinement can be painful, and Christ is in the midst of it, just as you know he is when, when children must confront an abuser or, or a disease. That verse in Joshua 1.9 implies that you know, aspects of one journey, one's journey could be fearful and might bring suffering. After all, a battle's underway. Our enemy could be external or internal, but it, it's, it's frightening either way because we wonder if we have the resources to fight. Released to an unchanging and omnipotent God, challenges will not unseal, but will transform us for his glory and for our good. But sanctification could be the scariest part, right? Because change is hard. It's uncomfortable. It's very often humbling, and it's painfully difficult. Often we're at war against sanctification, not against change. So we put on that shield and, and, and we not feel that impact of bad news, ignoring or denying or even merely reacting, right? Did the church do a bad thing? Leave the church. Did a company support child pornography? Stop buying their products. Did a friend disagree with you about your choice of spouse? Stop talking to them, right? But the, the full armor of God is given as defense against despair and doubt so that no one can go out and face conflict and suffering. Uh, they uplift others in prayer. They help others as they face fall out of sin, right? And, and accept truthful, loving counsel. We fasten that armor around us and we call, you know, the vulnerable under its protection against despair and abuse, we are able to do more than remain calm and forget about evil and sadness in order to live you know, with peace. We actually grow bolder to pick up our sword of truth and actively go after the lies in order to defend those weaker than ourselves. We find shelter against temptations of pride and fear and also fight at the same time. The full armor of God does not prevent suffering or, or encourage us to hunker down and hide unchanged. Christians strap this on so they can engage suffering and withstand the pain of refinement. That armor is available to all of us who declare Jesus as king, right, and, and as savior, because they're not expected to turn and run. In fact, they stay put. God fights the battle, right? He will fight it in you and around you, but mostly in you. Satan's strategies are ugly and they're underhanded. They're designed to chip away at the relationship between a Christian and Christ. He aims to instill that fear and doubt, right? Bad news should affect us. We should feel righteous anger when one of our brothers or sisters tells the shocking story of abuse. We should cry for them when they face a devastating diagnosis or, or when a child dies. Look at Christ, right? He, he wept for Martha and Mary when Lazarus died. Consider his anger at the money lenders in the temple who, who fleeced the Jews and mocked the Lord, 
right? Our understanding of the gospel deeper, it, it deepens with the extent to which we suit up and dive in. But change, in this sense, is not changing one's mind or losing one's faith, you know, selecting a new approach, w which bends the gospel to suit our needs or believing new things about Christ. You know, the Christian yearns for enrichment of what he already knows. We become more flexible to his purpose and less resistant to his transforming power. Paul declared that we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's in 2 Corinthians 3. Difficult as this is, the good news is that, you know, the, the Spirit works in us to accomplish His purpose. God is good, right? So the result will be good. The work's hard, but Christ does the work. While, while the believer should always be changing, you know, he or she does, does uh, a, a testimony to the power of the unchanging God, right? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God doesn't change. If he did, you know, how could we rely on his promise? How could we embrace hope or, or pursue a fearless devotion to, to a savior? We rely on him to be the unchanging center of our chaotic world. Let's jump into the Bible, right? The, here, let's get some stories out of that'll uh, give you some perspective. Experience, as as they say, is the best teacher, right? There's nothing quite like being slapped in the face to learn a lesson the hard way, you know. And, and there's not a textbook on earth that can actually do that. Life just has to happen for you to truly understand the pain, the victory, and all the complexity that goes with it. That's why experience will, will always be king on top of everything. But the great thing about experience, you know, being the teacher is that no one said it had to be yours. The shortcut to learning is to dissect the experience of others. You know, doing, doing that will not only give purpose to their life struggles, but you'll also have the pleasure of staying out of harm's way. So let's look at the Bible. Let's look at these unique situations where, where people still had experiences that we can relate to. And uh, let, let's jump in there and see what we can learn. Number one, let, let's jump into Joseph, right? We've had a series on Joseph already. Here's a recap. Born, born as, the, as the 11th son of his father, Jacob, Joseph had a unique position among all his brothers, right? He was the first son of his father's most beloved wife, well, you remember, polygamy is still accepted, and he was his father's favorite son. Combine those facts with, with the prophetic dreams that Joseph had and his eagerness to explain them to his older brothers, and you'll get the perfect conditions for him to be hated by everyone around, right? And because of this, Joseph's brothers devised a plan to kill him, but they eventually settled on selling him into slavery, right? So pretty cruel. But as we fast forward a few years, we see that the brother's scheme for Joseph actually put him on the path to fulfill the dreams he had earlier, right? By no means did Joseph gain authority overnight, but through a series of wise actions and unfortunate setbacks and seemingly coincidental events, Joseph eventually became second in command in Egypt, the land where he was sold into slave in, as a slave years before. And towards the end of the story, Joseph use, he uses his newfound power to provide and shelter all his people, including the brothers who once despised him. Right? Joseph's story is a testament to how God can use even the most evil actions to bring about the complex good. Right? So what do we learn from that? We learn patience. Right? In our world now, it, it, it might as well be a, a huge offense to make somebody wait. Right. If you're hungry, you go to the drive through. If you don't know an answer, you Google it quick. Right. And if you don't uh, text back within five minutes, um, people get offended. Right. So so imagine getting confirmation that you will one day have a position of power over the people who despise you, but being forced to wait for years for it to actually happen. Yeah, that would suck a little, you know. You'd feel motivated for a few months or even a year, but once all that time passed, most people would, would dismiss it as crazy talk. 
But Joseph didn't, right? He waited for his time to come, and he stayed true to God in the meantime. And that that brings about his faithfulness, right? It's clear that no matter the circumstance Joseph was in, he knew that God was the one he had to stay faithful to. And after Joseph is sold to Egypt, uh, he served under a high-ranking official, and, and he, over the course of time, becomes he finds favor in his eyes. And Joseph eventually rises to the prominent role in this house. And for the first time since he sold into slavery, it appears that Joseph was finally on track to fulfill his dreams, right? But the owner of that house had a wife. And the Bible describes Joseph as being handsome in appearance. And and this man's wife would definitely agree with that. So she tries to seduce Joseph multiple times, but he refuses. Uh, he refuses her advances, and, and he says that uh, he will. The, acting on that would not only be wrong against her husband, but against God Himself. So after an unsuccessful attempt to seduce Joseph again, the wife then claims that he attempts to rape her, and this leads to Joseph's hard-earned status and innocent reputation being destroyed as he was wrongfully imprisoned, right? But that's where interesting parts in the Bible, you know, and and at this point here, you, you never see the Bible recording Joseph blaming God or turning away from him during that time, you know, a, a time when it's only apparent uh, is to fulfill the dreams that were taken away. But Joseph wanted to please God no matter what, right? And this faithfulness allowed him to eventually leave the prison and gain that new position of power. But you can't talk about Joseph and not mention that forgiveness, right? If you go back to Genesis 43, you see that Joseph's brothers, you know, the, the ones that sell him into slavery, they come to their their unrecognizable sibling to buy grain in the middle of a famine, right? Joseph had every right to hold a grudge, uh, a grudge against them, and especially with his new position in Egypt, there's no telling what kind of punishment he could have done, right? But after a series of tests and observation that proved his brother's remorse, Joseph reveals his identity to him, and, and later he provides for his father's household, right? So without... Joseph's willingness to forgive his brothers, he couldn't have been sent ahead to preserve life. And his example shows us that, you know, even when others commit evil against us, God can always use it for good. Let's look at King David. Now, there's a lot of people in the Bible that God used to do extraordinary feats you know, the, with people that committed terrible deeds. Jacob was a, was a deceiver. Moses was a murderer, right? Samson Samson's lust got the better of him. Solomon turned to false gods. I don't know if people know that. You know, Peter denied Christ three times. You know, but the story of David, uh, there's arguably... Uh, <laughs> David's life is super interesting. You know, let's start from the beginning. He, and you can read this in Samuel, First Samuel. He kills a lion and a bear as a young man. We all know he slayed a giant who taunted his people and his God. He, he runs from a jealous king who wants to kill him. He, he fakes being insane to escape death. He commits adultery and essentially kills the woman's husband. He, he makes a decision that costs 70,000 men their lives. And then he runs from his own son who rebelled against him, right? Yet despite having a a history tainted by pain and disobedience and violence, the Bible describes David multiple times as a man after God's own heart, right? So what are the qualities, uh, what qualities get a man like that such favor in the eyes of God? Well, first of all, he was, uh, he repented a lot, you know? It's one thing, and I think repentance loses its luster, and no one really knows what it means anymore. I mean, it's another word we're confined to in the the Christian language, but if you're not part of the church community, it won't mean like anything to you, right? Repentance is very simple. It's a change of mind. It's a process where you critique your current thoughts, your behavior, and, and your lifestyle while, while also creating the opportunity to replace them with new ones. 
When the Bible calls for us to repent, it encourages us to review our current mindset and begin the path to life pleasing to God. Right? David David was all too familiar with repentance due to all the perils caused by his actions. And one of the reasons the Bible describes David as a man after God's own heart is that he always recognized wrong actions for the evils that they were. And then he went back to the way he knew to be right. Yeah, I mean, sure, he suffered horrendous consequences due to his actions, but, but he never allowed himself to permanently stray from God. And David's most striking character traits were his seemingly irrational faith and, and resulting boldness in God. But, but, you know, David's victory over Goliath wasn't about self-belief or brash coincidence or, or confidence. It, it, it's really not even about David at all. You know, all David did was surrender himself to the real hero of the battle. And David was bold because he allowed himself to be used by someone who will never be defeated. And when your confidence is placed in a person that great, it's hard to not come off a little cocky, Right. Although David usually comes to mind when you mention the kings of Israel, you know, he was actually the second person with that title. And we know that the, the first one, King Saul, was one strong and, and a promising leader who angered God with his disobedience. His refusal to obey God's command led to David's anointment uh, as a future king. And as the years went on, Saul's jealousy grew as fast as David's list of accomplishments grew, right? And soon that relationship deteriorated, deteriorated to the point where Saul tried to kill David, right? And, and if you read about that in 1 Samuel 19, you know, David flees for his life. But after retreating to a cave, David and his men noticed that Saul, the man who tried to kill him multiple times, had made his way to the same cave unaware of David's presence. David was close enough to the current king to cut the cloth from his garment. And when Saul's party began to leave, David surprised them by revealing himself and showing them all the piece of cloth he cut. David could have easily killed Saul and taken the throne if he wanted, but he respected Paul's position too much to do so. Even though Saul had become an angry, bitter, and, and, and jealous king at that point, David honored him by waiting on God's timing instead of his own. The Bible commands, you know, to respect the governing authorities. And Romans 13 talks about that. David's actions show us that trusting God's timing always leads to the best results. So let's jump to... Our third example is Solomon. I'll give you two more after this one. So King Solomon is one of the most interesting men in history, right? And his writings contributed to many of, of a lot of people's favorite books of the Bible. He's the son of King David, who I just was talking about, right? And his kingdom saw a time of historic prosperity, even though he was the son of Bathsheba, the woman David committed adultery with before. Another one of my favorites, right? Solomon's most, mostly known for his great wisdom, a gift that was given to him by God after he appeared to Solomon in a dream and gave him whatever he wanted. The Bible records many of Solomon's feats of wisdom, but if you really want a taste for it all, the book of uh, Proverbs contains many wise sayings written by that man himself, right? The beginning of Solomon's life and his rule were so great that it's depressing to see how it all degraded to the end. But, but you can see the Bible's uh, refusal to sugarcoat his story as a means to learn you know, the following lessons from life. And one of those is that, you know, everyone's heard of death and taxes, right? Um, but you read, there's a, there's a point in there where all the grumblings frustrate more than the perceived shortcomings. And to be fair to the generation um, of, of people who complain the most are the ones less willing to teach, right? And that's the problem King Solomon tried to solve. He knew that without strong teaching and guidance, a nation would stumble as the youth grew old. That's the main reason behind the book of Proverbs, right? Proverbs includes Solomon's call to the youth to gain wisdom and understanding, and the book also provides guidelines for living well in our world. 
He covers everything from investment to laziness to dealing with the opposite sex, the importance of strong relationships, and most importantly, the fear of the Lord. The reverence and healthy respect for God is the foundation Solomon builds upon. And the book of Proverbs makes it clear that the wisdom provided is priceless because it comes from the right source. But in order to spread that wonderful information, Solomon knew he had to teach it. Right? Proverbs 22 says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. Dil discipline and diligence. Right, two traits that are that are crucial to succeed in any endeavor. And that's why Solomon's writings stress them over and over and over. Right? You think a message like the the that would fall in do as I say, not as I do territory, coming from a king born into royalty, you know, but but Solomon was no stranger to work. Before his his father David died, he had an idea of for what would eventually become Solomon's greatest project, right? The temple in Jerusalem. David initially wanted to build that temple himself, but he was denied by God because David lived a life of war and violence, traits that are unbefitting of one who would build such a holy place. So he passed the job down to Solomon, and Solomon didn't disappoint, right? He oversaw the construction of the temple and used an uncanny attention to detail to follow the instructions that were given to him. He even used the extravagance of his kingdom to add all stylish torches uh, and touches to the new, uh, the new place of worship. And, and, you know, the temple's construction spanned seven years. Solomon's work on the temple was a huge success, but without his discipline and diligence, it wouldn't have happened. You know, Solomon's work serves as an example for us in our own projects, and his actions motivate, uh, motivate us to give, you know, when you're doing something, give, give our all to whatever we do, even if we're not inspired behind it. You know, the most heartbreaking thing about Solomon's life, you know, um, is that he turned away from God in his old age, and he lived a life that would have, dis you know, his, it would have disgusted his younger self. You know, read about his life, man. What a journey. It's true that, you know, most of his reign was glorious and he was, uh, his kingdom was blessed by God in a way that's hard for, you know, most of the modern world to imagine. But the resulting fame and fortune affected Solomon for the bad, right? He began to disobey parts of the laws given by his people or given to his people by God. Years later, as an old man, he was led astray by, um, his many f foreign wives, right? An arraignment clearly condemned by Israel's law. And he turned to false religious practices. That angered God so much, you know, mightily, it says in First King. So, you know, so he sent judgments that led to the destruction of Israel's kingdom and the enslavement of most of its people, just like he said he would. It's hard seeing a great man's life end in disappointing fashion. You know, and even though God didn't allow these judgments to occur during Solomon's life for David's sake, you can't help but wonder how the fallen king responded. Solomon had a life that began with such wisdom and money and fame, yet in the end, it still presents the question, what if, right? Hopefully we all avoid Solomon's negative example, though, you know, because I'd much rather echo the words of the Apostle Paul, um, and we'll get to him in a minute. Um, in his letter to Timothy, right, where he says, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. All right, moving on. Let's go two more. Let's do Jonah. Jonah. All right, so Jonah chapter one. Jonah was a prophet. We know this story, right? Uh, it's contained in only four Old Testament chapters. Um, but the book's one of the, the most fascinating reads. You know, so in short, if you've never heard of Jonah, uh, Jonah was told to preach to a foreign city, but he disobeyed. And that disobedience led Jonah into a series of unfortunate events. He was thrown overboard by a frightened crew. He was swallowed alive by a fish in the ocean. Then he was spit out three days later. Jonah then preached to the people uh, of that foreign city, right? And instead of experiencing the judgment that God originally planned for them, they listened to Jonah and then God showed mercy. And be, uh, because of his, his obedience to God at that point, God showed them mercy. 
But even though, you know, Jonah's mission ended in success, the book ends with God dealing with the bitterness still in Jonah's heart, right? A fact that always reminds us of, of, of things from your childhood, right? But the book of Jonah and the life of the prophet in general contain relevant lessons, I'll say, for all of us, right? Even though he wasn't uh, the most positive example, Loving your enemies. And that's the most difficult command the Bible teaches. And it takes center stage in the book of Jonah, right? Uh, it's Jonah's story is usually taught about, um, you know, it's a story about a coward who's swallowed by a fish. But when you understand the context of Jonah's mission and what it truly meant, you see that Jonah's life isn't just a side story hidden among the minor prophets. It's a reminder about who God is and the length he goes to to save the lost, Nineveh was the city Jonah was called to preach to, and Nineveh was a major city of the Assyrian people. The Assyrians had been enemies of Jonah's people for, for a long time. They were some of the most ruthless and wicked people around. Jonah wasn't so much afraid of these brutal people as he, as he uh, was hopeful that God would actually destroy them. Right? That was Jonah's primary conflict. He said it to himself in Jonah 4. Right? But later we see God's response to Jonah's bitterness towards his enemies. Right, And this response also explains why believers should forgive those who truly turn from their evil ways. And the point is, uh, we're commanded to love our enemies. That's because patience and understanding stem from the why behind the command. The truth is that most people don't do wrong for the sake of it. But, you know, they're never taught how to behave the right moral and spiritual way, right? They need mentors, you know, just like Solomon said. And this fact doesn't even consider the life circumstances that influence, influence everybody, right? The reason that we as believers are told not to judge is because we don't have the amount of data needed to make that judgment, only God can read the hearts and the minds of the people around the world. And the people we think that are out of reach might be the ones most receptive to the message. God knew the Ninevites would turn from their ways if they heard Jonah's message. He also knew they acted the way they did because they were never taught otherwise. So the next time you catch yourself judging somebody, starting point, uh, remember you're not qualified to do that. All right, so every believer has a responsibility to be a light in this world and show others who, who they are through word and deed, right? That's the bare minimum for every Christian. But a few of us are called to do a little bit more. And while some may say that it's a, it's a reason to be excited, and it definitely is, by the way, it can also be a tremendous burden. Jonah found out what happens when you turn uh, and run from this call. And if he were here today, I'm sure he'd tell you that running causes more problems than you can imagine. God doesn't make mistakes. So if you run from something he's told you to do, you're pretty much telling him he doesn't know what he's doing. And that's awfully foolish if you ask me. Last guy, number five. Last but not least, unless you ask the man himself, the Apostle Paul. Paul is the only New Testament example because... Um, I didn't put Christ on the list here, but that's not to say there aren't other great men introduced in the New Testament, right? Uh, the stories and the letters written by or about Jesus or Paul account for the majority of the text, right? Uh, uh, an incredible fact, given that Paul referred to himself as the least among the apostles, right? He says that in 1 Corinthians. But don't let that humility fool you. Paul was a great man of God who made superhuman efforts to spread the good news about Christ to the world. Paul's life mission was to spread the gospel message to the Gentiles, right? His actions served as the example for all mission trips in the modern world. Paul's work of teaching and leading by the early church cemented his legacy as a transformed man used greatly by God. Now, I can't help but mention that he had one of the most compelling writing styles of any biblical author, Right? You could spend weeks there talking about uh, about lessons from Paul. But, but the reason Paul described himself as the least of the apostles was because he began as one of their enemies. Paul was a man formerly known as Saul, 
who highly, this man was highly educated in the Jewish religious law, and he viewed the message of Christ's work as foolishness. The news of Christ, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, the news of Jesus' death and, and resurrection was a stumbling block to him, right? He didn't understand why Jesus' followers um, got rid of the religious customs and traditions he knew so well and instead embraced simple faith in one person. Paul's zealous beliefs and upbringing led him to become a religious extremist. And even though many Christians today hold Paul in such high regard, you, you skip over the fact that he was essentially a terrorist, right? He was infamous for the crimes he committed against Christians, which is why those who knew his reputation were skeptical after Paul's conversion. But Paul's miraculous encounter with Christ changed him into a new man. And the new mission he received led him to do God's true will, something he only thought he was doing before, right? So in today's culture, we tend to think of any form of hate as a bad thing, you know, but, but that concept was foreign to Paul and, and to the Bible in general, really. Numerous Bible passages tell us to arbor what is evil, cling to what is good, and some of the harshest punishments described in the Bible were reserved for those who knew what was right but still chose to disobey. The Apostle Paul dealt strongly with believers who caused discord in the church. And he even encouraged believers to ostracize wrongdoers who claimed to be Christians. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul cleared the misconception that all people who did wrong had to be avoided, and he explained how it was God's job to judge, to judge unbelievers. Love and mercy are always prescribed for those outside the church. But for those who knew how to act, it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn. And that's a truth Paul knew all too well, right? Right? Paul described how he had become all things to all people, meaning that in order to spread the good news of Jesus' work, Paul used every advantage he had to relate to his audience and promote Christianity in a more efficient way. For example, Paul was a Roman citizen, you know, a fact that the once proud Jewish zealot would not have embraced. But he later used his status to avoid unlawful punishment from the authorities, and then later to teach other Romans during the height of their empire. In another instance, you see Paul speaking at the meeting uh, in, in a Greek council that, that held uh, philosophical debate and religious conversations, right? And in that story, we're told that the Greeks had a moment uh, for each known God in existence, uh, um, and they would give homage to all of these. So basically, they had monuments to all of these other gods, and there was a blank altar there called, and it was labeled the unknown God. Paul used that opportunity to explain the truth of God, you know, to people who were very religious. And he did so by making an argument in natural theology, a way to learn about God by observing his creations. Paul then used God's status as creator to appeal to the Greeks' reasoning as to why they should repent. And these methods work to an extent, you know, since we know that some men joined him and believed. And finally, you know, Paul became weak in an admittedly unwilling way where the thorn in his flesh, that we still don't know what that was, a painful issue for him that God chose not to take away. But there's plenty of speculation as to what that ailment actually was. But the truth is that it caused Paul to display God's power even more. And we went over this this last time, like what, uh, what it was that what was the thorn in his flesh. A lot of theory on that. Um, you know, but not only did God's strength become evident in, evidence in, in Paul, but if Paul was the source of his own power, he would have simply healed himself. But the issue uh, also allowed Paul to relate to those with similar weakness. And, and that fact summarizes the whole theme of versatility, right? Paul wouldn't have related to his audiences without similar experiences. But fortunately, he shared background and weakness and understanding, and that allowed him to complete his life's mission. You know, it's the same thing as you, you go through a tragedy or, or something that 
has happened specifically to you, you can relate to others that have gone through that same thing. A lot better than somebody who just says, yeah, I sympathize with you and I feel bad and I understand. Yeah, but if you've gone through the same thing, yeah, you do understand, right? That's a wrap, right? All that's left for you is to decide how your story will go. Here's some examples of people that went through some life-changing events, uh, some very significant in their life and what happened with them. Uh, now you have to decide how your story goes, you know, because even though all five of those men are long, you know, they're dead and gone, uh, their stories still give life today, right? So, so will your story do the same? Will your life be a model for generations to follow or will it repulse them for years to come? That's what you have to decide. It's your choice. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your patience with us. Father, you alone made us in your image and you created our world and everything in it. It was no accident. It was no chance, no, no chance happening. It was meticulously orchestrated with precision and exactness. Thank you for your design. Father, thank you in advance for the answer to our prayers. We come before you now to focus on changing our lives. Maybe we're in part of our life where, you know, where we're lost and we're looking for direction. We need guidance. As your word shows us, there are many people in the Bible who needed to change as well. And many of them went through drastic change. Some of us need to go through that as well. And a lot like those in the Bible, you were with them every step of the way. Father, give us the strength and the guidance to make the changes necessary in our lives to move forward. When we change and learn, what we move forward. There's a lot of changes in our lives that happen all the time. Your word says you never leave us. I pray for your hand in getting us there. And for the ones who are struggling more than others, the ones who know they need change but are afraid, give them strength and courage to face the unknown. For the ones who are facing a change ahead of us, and it is scary not knowing what will happen next, let us focus on knowing that you have our plans already laid down and our path is already set. And as we give you the glory for those things, in Jesus' name, we can get through all things. Amen. Remember, the scripture says anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. That's all gone away. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So you could be at that point in your life where you're searching hard and you're trying to find answers. Try to find Jesus. You know, every day we know it's one day closer to the, the remainder of this prophecy being fulfilled. You are not promised another day in this life, right? Don't put this off and don't say, I'll think about it later. Um, Jesus is standing at the door and he's knocking. All you have to do is, is open the door. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't do this alone. I believe you came and died for me and I believe you're coming back again. I give my heart to you. Come into my life, be the leader in my life. And if you pray that simple prayer, you'll be saved. That's it. Um, if you need a Bible, then you reach out to us and you say, I need a Bible. I'll ship one out to you. Right? This poor man called, the Lord heard him, and he saved him out of all his troubles. Right? At the bottom of the tonguespeakslife.com, you can say, I need a Bible. Go there. If you go to... Um, Psalm346ministries.org Say, hey, I need a Bible Go to Facebook and, and look at Psalm346ministries You can message there, say, I need a Bible You can go to p346.shop And put a Bible in your shopping cart for free So many ways to get a Bible oh, Get a Bible, find out who this, this man is and, and like I say all the time Be strong and be courageous And don't be afraid and don't be discouraged The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. That's Joshua 1.9. And uh, man, is that true? Thank you so much. And I will see you next time.